All right, so we're going to talk about something positive this week, and that is pro-social behavior, or the behavior of helping others. So pro meaning like advocating, going towards, and then social, so relationships. So building relationships, helping society. So um, basically it's any action intended to benefit another rather than yourself. Um, although certainly you could be pro-social towards yourself, and some people are antisocial. Um, altruism, pure true altruism, is the concept that you are helping somebody else without any expectation of getting something in return. This is a big philosophical question that people like to debate on. Is there any such thing truly as pure altruism? And that's based on the argument, some people would say, that yes, you could help somebody else, but there's always some benefit. Maybe you feel better about yourself. You have a better self-image. Other people look at you more positively. You're doing it to please God, and so you know, you'll, you're know you expecting a reward in heaven or whatnot. Um, and yeah, I guess you could say that there's always some benefit to helping another person, so there's no true altruism. But... Um, I don't know, that's just a really, I, I don't know, it's an excessive type of argument. I mean, that's just, leave that to the philosophers. And if you're a philosopher, feel free to argue about it. Um, but I think that altruism is something that you're not expecting anything material in return. Um, I don't know, I won't get into this too much, but certainly there are altruistic behaviors. People sacrifice their lives for others. They give up their wealth. They give up their life in, you know, like uh, World War II, people helped Jews to escape, and there was, what was in it for them? Yeah, maybe they felt a little better about themselves. Maybe they felt like they had pleased God. Maybe, you know, they, they got some of those intangible benefits, but there certainly was not much in it for them. So I believe there is pure, true altruism and that just because you feel better about yourself doesn't negate the fact that it was certainly an altruistic behavior. All right, so why do we help others? Um, you can get stuff out of it. So genetic and material benefits. Genetic meaning that um, people who help others are more attractive. And so the genetic benefit would be a better uh, spouse and better children ideally. <laughs> um, you increase your social status, people approve of you. Again, you can feel better about yourself managing your self-image, your moods and emotions. So there's a lot of benefits to helping other people. But of course it makes society better, which makes a safer society for you and your children, which is also another more long-term benefit, but it is certainly something that people think about. Now, evolutionary psychologists like to say that our desire to help is something that evolved, and that could be true. For sure, we know that if you are helpful, that it helps to protect your family, and you'll see in this chart here that um, you are more likely to volunteer to help if it is your immediate family, so parents, siblings, children. Uh, if you're if your grandparents, then that's the most uh, next likely that you're willing to volunteer to help, then your first cousins, and then strangers. Okay, so your family, immediate, and then the immediate extended family are the most likely for you to volunteer your help. And then uh, strangers, obviously, the, the least likely. And uh, this chart obviously doesn't go into it, but you are more likely to be willing to help certain types of strangers. So the more similar they are to you, the more likely you are to volunteer to help. Um, so we might say that somebody's racist because like a white person's more likely to help a white person or a black person's more likely to help a black person. Um, I don't think that's racism when it's done on sort of a subconscious human level. It's programmed into all of us. Um, certainly it can turn into racist behavior, but it's a natural inclination, inclination, inclination of humans to do that. Um, and I do think we need to draw a line between purposeful racist behavior and then something that humans are just like have a natural tendency to do. Uh, and we'll talk about how helpful behavior is something that's also socialized. So that's something that can be taught is, um, you can 
teach people to embrace that behavior and become racism. And you can also teach them to be aware of that behavior um, and that they have a requirement, a duty in life, what we used to call the Christian duty, to help everyone. Not necessarily that everybody acted on that, but it's something that was taught. It was a phrase that was often used. When I was a kid, people said that all the time. Well, it was my Christian duty. Um, and so there was a socialized responsibility to help people who even fell into this category. Anyhow, so... Um, uh, an individual's net success at getting his or her genes passed on, not only in his or her own offspring, but also in the offspring of any relative. So inclusive fitness. Are you, uh, are you fit to, pass, to be included in the passing on of genetics? Um, helping others, even risking our own survival to help others, increases the chance that we will have this inclusive fitness, that we will pass on our genes. Um, that's why people will die for their children. So a lot of times we talk about how we have this instinct for survival, but then why do people sacrifice themselves for others? Well, the people most likely to sacrifice themselves will be in this category here. You'll sacrifice yourself mostly for your children. And evolutionary psychology or evolution in general would say you would do that in order to help your genes pass on. Um, again, one of the problems, I've talked about this before, Actually, I'm not sure if I talk about it in this class or not, but um, one problem with evolutionary psychology, like evolution in general, is you can't go back in time and prove that this is why this certain function evolved. So we could hypothesize that people will sacrifice themselves for others to pass on their genetics, but we have no idea if that's, you know, if you go back to the caveman was that actually why they were sacrificing themselves for others? Did that actually help pass on their genetics? I, I don't know. You don't know that. So it's just a hypothesis that can never be proven until a time machine is developed. Um, so just remember that with any sort of evolutionary psychology theory is that it is conjecture and there's not any proof to the majority of these theories. Okay, I don't even think they should be classified as a theory. They're just a, a conjecture. Because um, a theory has some evidence behind it, and there would be zero evidence of the idea that we help in order to have our genes passed on. Maybe we're helping our children just because we like them. Um, although certainly there's times when people sacrifice themselves for children they don't like. But there's also many times when people are abusing their children. So why is that happening? You know, that flies in the face of the evolutionary theory of help. So, um, so yeah, it's an interesting idea, but we don't know for sure that that's true. Uh, reciprocal aid is another idea that we developed the desire to help others because we will get help back. There will be return for prior help. Uh, so we get reciprocal aid. It's reciprocated. Okay, and it's consistent with other norms and ideas of reciprocity. Um, and there's certainly a lot of truth to that. We often help people. You know, I, I have a farm, and in any farming community, you depend a lot on your neighbors for help. And so I will go out of my way to help them when I'm able to, because I know there will be a time when I need help. Um, like one one year, I fell off a horse and broke my arm, and, that's, and I had like 10 goats I was milking. And... Um, and my neighbor came every day for three months, twice a day, and she milked my goats, which is amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so I definitely develop relationships because I know they need help now, but I will need help later. Okay, so that is that is for sure one reason. that I don't know if that's why we evolved the desire to help, and and you could argue that maybe we didn't evolve that at all. Maybe humans started with the desire to help. We don't know that until that time machine is made. Maybe we can go back in time and see that original humans were extremely selfish and had zero inclination to help. Uh, although if, I think if that was the case, then I'm not sure humans would have survived. But anyhow, that's conjecture too. So, uh, using behavioral genetics to study helping. So we have looked at identical twins and their help behavior. Identical twins, of course, share all of their DNA. Non-identical twins share half of their DNA, just like regular siblings. 
Um, but then, of course, they share a more similar environment. But when we look at these twin studies, we find that identical twins are much more alike in their helping patterns and their willingness to help than non-identical twins or regular siblings. Identical twins are more likely to also help each other. Okay, now, why they do that? Um, maybe it's just because they're so similar, they've shared so much of life together. Some people say identical twins have some sort of special psychic connection, I don't know. Um, so, again, we can describe these behaviors, but many times explaining them in psychology is very difficult. Now, we do know the tendency to help is due about equally to genetic factors and to non-genetic or environmental factors. So you are born with a tendency to be helpful or not helpful. We call that pro-social and antisocial. Some people are born very antisocial, but that's not all there is to it. You know, in the early 1900s, we believed that genetics was all, DNA was destiny. And that's, of course, why we had the uh, eugenics movement here in America, where it was much more underground, um, but like abortion was part of the eugenics movement, getting rid of the undesirables. And some people argue that that's still going on. Uh, you know, we, we forcibly castrated many women where we removed their uterus so that they couldn't have children. And that kept going up until the 70s, maybe the 80s. I think it was the 70s when that was made illegal. But that wasn't that long ago. Um, and then, of course, Nazi Germany, we saw where the eugenics movement was not underground and was very obvious about getting rid of the undesirable because we believed back then that genetics was everything. You know, it was just, just in, um, not invented, discovered, and people were so excited about this idea of DNA, and of course, like humans do, we tend to go overboard, and uh, now we know that everything is partially genetic, partially environmental. And our helpfulness, our desire to help, is equal. So even if you're born antisocial, you can be trained and taught and surrounded by people who are very pro-social, and you can be taught to overcome those antisocial tendencies. And it's your job as a parent to teach your child to instill beliefs in them that helping is important. Whether you're a Christian or not, the Christian duty, it's your, it's a requirement in life for you to help other people, whether you like them or not, is something you should be teaching your children and certainly something that you should be trying to live out and teach your children by example. Okay, so people are most likely to help, or people who are most likely to help are those that most strongly believe that doing so can produce gains for the helper. Okay, so... If you believe that helping other people is a benefit to you, then you are more likely to help. Now, that sounds selfish, but who cares? Selfishness is something that can be used to our advantage. So teach your children the benefits of helping others. And not just like, you know, if you help your boss, maybe you'll get a pay raise. That's something good to teach them. Um, you know, I had my nine-year-old nephew was here at the farm the other day helping to do some work. And, of course, being a total lazy nine-year-old. And I said to him, you know, the faster you do this work, the faster you can go and play. And, and th well, that didn't get him too excited. But, you know, I was trying to instill a belief that there are benefits to you to helping. Um, and then I said to him, and I think this finally got him to work. I was like, you know, none of us like to work. Um, but are you going to be lazy like this when you have a job? And uh, I didn't call him lazy, but or maybe I did. I don't know. Sometimes a kid needs to be called lazy. <laughs> Just occasionally. Sometimes you need some tough love, but not too often. Um, but <laughs> I said, you know, what happens when you have a job and you're just kind of, you know, standing there not doing the work and your boss sees you do that? You're going to get fired. Is that the kind of person that you want to be? So, um, and then he kind of worked a little bit better after that. But uh, you should teach your child that there's benefits to helping. Helping is a wonderful thing. Not only do you feel better about yourself, but you're you're doing good things for the world. And so you should teach them. Um, you know, a, a better time we had was we had a homeless family show up at the farm because we have a Airbnb here. So I guess, I don't know, they were hoping for some place to stay in exchange for working. and um, And at the time we couldn't accommodate them, but... You know, the kids were there and, and uh, we had a birthday cake from or a wedding cake from the night before because we used to do weddings out here. 
and uh, you know we made them a cup of hot chocolate and gave them some cake and then we paid for a few days at a hotel for them you know to and gave them some extra money to get on their feet and uh, that's such a great experience for the kids to see that um, and then to also explain to them why that's such a good thing to do. You know, you should always be explaining things to your children. You should always be talking to them and helping to instill those beliefs, both by how you act as well as through conversation. Humans learn through conversation. Okay, that's the learning process. People can be educated to believe that pro-social is or is not personally prudent. In, or, in other words, um, personally helpful, good for you. Okay. And be careful because you can also teach your child not to help. Okay? And you don't want to do that. We have way too much of that in this world. And then we need an expanded sense of we. We need we-ness. It's not just you. It's not just your family. You're interconnected to the rest of the world. And that, of course, develops mostly in the home. We try to teach it in the school system nowadays with this um, sort of what we some people call like the liberal agenda in schools. Um, and... There's nothing wrong with that, that the schools are trying to teach we-ness and connectedness to the people around us, but it's really something that develops in the home. And unless the family is doing it, it's not going to get taught. So um, while growing up, humans react to those present as if they are relatives. Okay, So it's not just genetic connectedness, but those who are just in the household. And then positive contact in the home with individuals from a wide spectrum of backgrounds expands one sense of we. So the best way for you to make your child feel connected to others is to have a social home. Let people come in, let them see you interacting positively with other people. Um, and that will, that's the best way to decrease racism right there, is a child grows up in a home with white parents and the white parents have a black friend. Okay, that's how you decrease racism. You don't do it by rioting or protesting or wearing t-shirts with witty labels. You do it by having a friend who's a different race than you. All right, um, I talked about this before. P you're more likely to help people who are similar to you. Appearance, personality, attitudes, job, income level, whatever is important to you, religion, um, you're more likely to help those who are similar. Also, you're more likely to help those who are familiar, which is why, like, if you want to decrease racism, um, you know, if you're a member of the Black Lives Matter movement and this is something that you're passionate about, um, then don't just talk about to your children that racism is terrible and you want it to stop. Invite some white people over to your home and have a nice meal together um, because you're creating familiarity between the races and the more familiar people are with each other, the less um, racism, the more pro-social behavior there will be, okay? assuming it's positive experiences. <laughs> right? If you're familiar with somebody who abuses you, then that's, that's not necessarily the case. Um, the president of Ireland said uh, maybe a decade or two ago that the Irish were never racist until other races came to Ireland. So sometimes familiarity, if there are bad interactions, can be negative and can cause antisocial behavior. So you need positive, obviously you need positive interactions to create pro-social behavior effect with familiarity. Uh, social responsibility. The social responsibility norm is a societal rule that people should help those who need them to help. Not all societies have a social responsibility norm. If you go to other countries, their culture may be very low on this and they don't think that you should help others. They don't care about people who are having a hard time in life. Or maybe they, I shouldn't say they don't care, but they don't care as much as a different society. So I know I've talked about this already multiple times, but um, you know, in Christian culture, there is a social responsibility norm that you have a duty to help others. Now, of course, not everybody lives up to that duty, but because that norm is there, there's social pressure on you that you're a bad person if you're not helping those around you. And so that norm is really good, and it's one of the reasons why, um, like, the United States was the first country um, in sort of modern history to banish slavery. And uh, and England, of course, was was right there with them. 
Actually, did England do it first? I can't remember. I think America did it first. But, um, but because both of those countries were Christian countries, meaning that it was the predominant religion, and they had this sense of Christian duty, this social responsibility norm, people said this is not Christian to have slaves. We shouldn't be doing this. And there was this pressure started to build because of a social responsibility norm that we needed to abolish this. Uh, and then, of course, the Republican Party started in order to abolish slavery, and um, eventually the Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, got rid of it, and yeah, millions of people died for that. So, And that was all because of a social responsibility norm. Okay. Um, now, the bystander influence is an action of the social responsibility norm. Okay, So... If you are a bystander, do you feel like you are a source of help? Um, bystanders are sources of information about whether helping is required. Sources of approval or disapproval in helping and action. So the people around you, I, this is the, the social pressure that I'm talking about. That's a bystander influence. Um, so if there are people around you watching and they expect you to help, then you are more likely to to act in a certain way. So there's sources of information about whether helping is required. If the people around you are saying, oh, they don't deserve help or, or whatever, then that is a source of inf information and you're less likely to act. The more people standing around physically, um, these, these are sources of help and it can dis diffuse the responsibility of helping. So I'm... a uh, going to post a video about Kitty Genovese, which was a murder that happened in New York, or she was a girl who was murdered in New York, and she was attacked with a knife multiple times in the middle of a busy New York apartment uh, residential building area, and everybody thought somebody else was going to help her, and nobody helped her. Nobody called the police or anything and she was eventually murdered. He kept coming back because lights would come on, people would look out the window and he'd run off, but then nobody did anything to this poor girl who was being stabbed to death. And so he would come back and I think he came back three times before he finally killed her. That's called the bystander effect. All right, um, so are there other sources of help? Are uh, the other sources telling you that help is needed? And are they approving or disapproving of you for helping? All helps you to make a decision of whether you help others or not. So if you're by yourself, you make your own decision to help. But if there's people around you, then these people affect you and change whether you're willing to help another person. Like, for example, let's say it's the 1950s when racism against blacks was arguably at its highest. I mean, there was a lot of conflict, so I'd say it was, at least definitely, it was very high in the 50s. Um, and let's say, um, so uh, let's say a, a, you're white, uh, African American gets, I don't know, injured or something, something happens and they need help. If you're by yourself, then you decide whether to help them or not based on your personal beliefs. If you're very racist, then maybe you don't help them. If you're not very racist, then and and maybe you have personal beliefs instilled in you that helping other people is your duty, then you're going to help the person. However, if there are people around, then you look to see, is there somebody else who can help them? You know, if somebody's gotten to them before you have, even if you want to help, and then you see that they've already been helped and you're not going to help. Okay, because there's other people there who can help. Then you look around, is anybody else concerned? Like maybe there's, this person is just laying in the middle of the sidewalk and they look unconscious. Is anybody else concerned? Are they looking at them like there's a problem? If they're not, then maybe you say, oh, well, I don't know, maybe that person's just drunk. Or maybe, um, maybe they're just a bum and they're just sleeping. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe they have narcolepsy, so they don't need your help. Um, but if people are looking concerned, then you're more likely to help. And then, uh, are other people approving or disapproving of you for helping? So let's say this is the 1950s, it's a black person, a black guy who's laying on the sidewalk unconscious, and you're in California in the 50s. 
people would be much more likely, because Californians have always been a less, less racist community, they would look on you more with approval for, for helping that person, and that would encourage you to help them. However, let's say you were in Mississippi in the 1950s, you would get a lot of disapproval and possibly social repercussions for helping that person. And so even if you wanted to help them, you'd be less likely to because the other, the bystanders are a source of, in this case, disapproval for helping. Okay. So uh, deciding whether to help somebody is complicated, surprisingly. Um, okay, we already talked about bystander effect and diffusion of responsibility with the Kitty Genovese case. And again, I'll find a video and post that for you. Um, some other things that affect it, um, pluralistic ignorance. So this is a phenomenon in where people misperceive the beliefs of others because everyone acts inconsistently with their belief. So um, basically it's saying that a group of people can be ignorant because they... Uh, how do I explain this? Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, my brain's not working to get today. Let me. Let's see. Pluralistic ignorance example. All right. So. Here we go, here's an example. So imagine you're sitting in a large lecture hall listening to an especially complicated lecture. Hopefully not by me. Okay, where's the rest of this? After many minutes of incomprehensible material, the lecturer pauses and asks if there are any questions. No hands go up. You look around the room. Could these people really understand what the lecturer is talking about? You yourself are completely lost. Your fear of looking stupid keeps you from raising your hand, but as you look around the room at your impassive clients, classmates, you interpret their similar behavior differently. You take their failure to raise their hands as a sign that they understand the lecture material. Okay, so that's pluralistic ignorance. You're misinterpreting the beliefs of the group. Um, and so in this case, you think they all must understand it, but really they're not raising their hands because they're also afraid of looking stupid. Okay, so where did that lecture go? Uh, oh, right there, Dug right in front of me. So in the case of helping, you everybody might just be standing there looking like it's not a big deal, that this person doesn't need help, and you think that they're not helping because they think that the person doesn't need help, but really they're not helping because they're looking around trying to figure out if you think that person needs help. Yeah, pluralistic ignorance. All right, anyhow, we've talked about all this, desire for approval, um, helping models, we've talked about that. If you if people model pro-social behavior, then people are more likely to help. Um, population density. The denser the population, the less help is given. So city people are much less helpful than country people. Perhaps it's to deal with the stimulus overload and the stress of living in the city. You're constantly surrounded by a crush of people. There's no privacy. So you close yourself off in order to protect yourself from that overload and then you don't see the needs of others or maybe you because you have so much invasion of your privacy maybe you don't want to invade the privacy of others by helping them and so in a city people are much less likely to be helpful than country people which is why I live in the country also where you live can affect it um, so some cities are more helpful than others. So in this study, they looked at different measures of helpfulness, so willingness to help a blind person cross the street, make change for a quarter, which would be an annoying little thing to do, pick up a dropped pen, mail a lost letter, pick up magazines dropped by a disabled person, and contr contributed to United Way. So population density, rather than the size of a city, was uh, the biggest factor in whether people were willing to help. The denser the population, the less helpful they were. Okay. So these are the five most helpful cities. Rochester, New York, Houston, Texas, Nashville, Memphis, Knoxville. So these all have big populations, but they're not densely populated. They're spread out. Whereas these cities are hugely densely populated, um, and they're 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 all squished together in a small area. 
Okay, they're not sprawling areas like these ones are. They're densely populated. So it's how densely populated is the area. I mean, Patterson, New Jersey is a tiny little city, but it has a huge population in the tiny little city. Right? So the more squished together you are, the less helpful you are. Gender is also part of it. Women are more likely to help, um, and we also help in different ways. So males are more likely to be gallant and strong. They're more likely to be knights in shining armor for people, whereas women are more likely to be nurturing. They're caring and gentle. So we help in different ways, but it's still help. Men are more likely to help when a situation requires a heroic direct assistance. Women are more likely to help when the situation calls for nurturing and supportive help. So um, it may be wrong to say that women are more helpful. Um, there are more situations when nurturing supportive help is needed. Um, but if somebody is, like for instance, when I was in elementary school, I remember a friend of mine, his dad drowned saving two little kids who had been swept out in a riptide. He managed to get them to shore, but he had gotten so much water in his lungs that when he crawled onto shore, he died. Um, so his death was as dramatic as his rescue. Uh, so... A woman is much more likely to stand there and go, oh my gosh, the children are getting swept away, it's so terrible, um, and the children die. Men are more likely to die attempting to rescue another person than a woman is. So, I don't know, it's hard to say. I mean, quantity-wise, yes, women are probably more helpful. Um, but in the amount of help given, perhaps you could say that men give more help because the situations when they help are so much more intense and more risky. So, yeah, so apples and oranges. All right, uh, I've already talked a lot about this religious and ethical codes, personalized no personal norms. If you have internalized beliefs and values linked to helping, you're more likely to help. If you have religious and ethical codes that influence the degree to which you help, you're more likely to help. And some religions push helping and other religions don't so if you are part of a religion that doesn't push helping you're less likely to help okay so uh let's think of an example within the christian world so um catholicism traditionally has not been a big pusher of helping other people it's been more focused on personal responsibility so you do have some personal norms there but not um, oh no, I'm sorry. I, I'm not saying that right. You, you have a push for personal good behavior, but not necessarily as big of a push for helping others. Not to say it isn't there. It's certainly there. Um, but versus like evangelical Christianity where, I mean, just the term evangelical is about going out and talking to other people. So the push to interact and help others is tremendous in evangelical Christianity versus something like Catholicism or non-evangelical types of Christians. Okay. And that's just one example. Of course, you could look at, you know, how much does Islam talk about helping others versus Judaism and, and so on. But I'm not going to get into all of that. All right. So reasons people say they helped others. Um, number one is it's my personal value. Number two, it's my religious belief. Number three, it's that my parents were good people and they helped other people, so that's why I help other people. Uh, four is I received help in my past. Somebody else helped me, and so I want to pay it forward. And then um, a prior crisis, so I've gone through a hardship. You know, I, I was abused, and so I want to help people who are abused. So these are the top reasons why people do pro-social behavior, why they say they do pro-social behavior. So you can see why it's so important, like if you're raising a kid, to teach them to have helping as a personal value, to be part of a religious um, belief system that pushes helping, to be an example, and to help your kid, right? I don't think you should traumatize your child so they help other people, but certainly if they've been through trauma, you can use that as a way to teach them to help other people and to use that crisis in a, in a good way. You know, if you have a, a kid who had leukemia, um, then maybe once they're over it, 
then you say, you know, now we can use this, we can help other kids with leukemia. You know, we can bring them teddy bears in the hospital or something like that. So always use anything bad that happens as something good. Because it also helps the child to get over it. Um, okay, labeling effects and self-focus. So labeling effects is the way we decide who we are on the inside, is to look outside ourselves to the reactions of others. So we also call this the uh, mirror effect. So people are a mirror to ourselves. How do people react to us? How do they label us? Uh, you know, we talk in psychology about we shouldn't label people, but we label people all the time. Everybody labels each other. So studies show that pro-social labels lead to pro-social behavior. So um, I don't know if your family does this, but in my family, any time a baby, like, picks something up randomly and gives it to you, we're like, oh, thank you. That's so helpful of you. That's such a nice thing. Thank you for giving me this bottle of dangerous medication that you somehow got somewhere. I don't know how you managed to get that, you know. So it's just, I don't know, it's just a habit we have in our family. But it's its a good habit because that, it, you're labeling the child as a helpful, good, nice, kind person. And also one that cleans up, I guess. Um, and one that gives you the things they find. That's really good because sometimes they do find something like medication or a knife or I don't know whatever random crap a piece of glass they found in the dirt and if you teach them to give it to you then um, they're much safer <laughs> so just a little parenting tip there um, so uh, which is on a farm it's extra important but anyhow you can label your child as a helpful child versus a friend of mine and I use the term friend loosely um, she would call her child a brat. My kid is such a brat, such a brat. And the kid is now a teenager and she is such a brat. And it's like, are you really surprised? Because you've been telling that child she was a brat since she could walk, you know, since she was born, basically. You've been saying she was a brat. She doesn't sleep at night because she's a brat. No, she doesn't sleep at night because she's a baby. And that's what babies do. Um, so anyhow, how you label your child or yourself has a big effect on their later behavior. People will live up to the label that they're given. Self-focus. We focus on personal values, and how much we focus on personal values can either increase or decrease helping depending on situational factors. Okay, So assistance is more frequent when self-focus is combined with the presence of a prominent, legitimate need for aid. Um, so basically what this is saying is the more focused we are on ourselves, the more self-focused we are, the more selfish we are. If we focus on the people around us, we are more likely to help, which makes sense, okay? Um, but here's an example. This is an example of like when assistance is not frequent. So there was a study that was done where students were told um, they had an exam on a certain date. And this professor was really mean. I won't do this to you guys. And then they came to class, and it was like scheduled, so it was individually scheduled. And they came to the classroom, and then they were told, oh, I'm so sorry, the class got moved, there was a problem in this classroom, so you have to go to this other classroom that's on the far side of campus. So they were given a personal problem. Now some students, and then on the way, to the classroom. So they're going from classroom here to the classroom over here on the other side of campus. And in the middle, there is a guy laying on the sidewalk. And it's like it was like a really narrow place, so it was hard to get around him. Now, in some uh, for some students, they were told, you've been given extra time, you've got it takes 10 minutes to get to the other side of campus, and you've got 20, so plenty of time to get over there. And then other students were told, you have no extra time. This is a hard exam. It takes 10 minutes to get over there. It starts in basically five. So you're already late. You need to get over there ASAP. And so they felt very stressed about getting to the other classroom on time. Unsurprisingly, the students who had extra time, who were not absorbed in their personal problem, when they came across the guy laying in the middle of the sidewalk, they stopped and helped him. The vast majority of them stopped and helped him, asked him if he was okay before continuing on to their classroom. The ones who felt stressed and rushed because 
all they could focus on was getting to the classroom. When they got to that guy laying in the middle of the sidewalk, in the middle of the path, most of them stepped over, literally stepped over top of him in order to continue on their way and didn't see, didn't check to see if he was okay. All right, so if we are overly self-focused, if we're stressed, if we're in a rush, this might be one of the reasons why cities have less helpful behavior as well, um, then we are less likely to help other people. Now, if the need is obvious, like if the guy was laying there with blood squirting out of an artery, even being stressed out and absorbed in a self in a personal problem, because it was a salient or legitimate problem, they would still most likely help stop and help this guy. Um, but if if they're self-absorbed, if they're self-focused, if they're stressed out, and then it's not as super obvious that help is needed, then you're much more less likely to help. Okay. All right, uh, deciding to help friends. So research suggests that we may not want our friends to do better than us on important tasks because it could negatively affect our self-esteem. So sometimes we don't help our friends because we kind of feel competitive with them. It might make us feel bad. Um, depending on who that friend is and how we wish to help our, to view ourselves, we might actually try to maintain self-esteem by helping less, which is kind of sad, but it is something that occasionally happens. Um, but then, it, on again, friends have this similarity and familiarity effect, so we are still more likely to help our friends than other people. But if it's going to hurt our self-esteem, then sometimes we have a hard time sacrificing our feelings in order to help other people. Okay. Also, whether we accept help or ask for help, this can affect our self-concept by implying um, that we're incompetent, dependent, or inadequate. You know, I haven't talked about cults at, at all, but whether, you know, cults, helping behavior and pro-social behavior is certainly a huge part of cult mentality. You're supposed to help the cult. And initially, you're taught to help those around you and the, the cult is there to be your friend sort of deal. Um, and then, of course, you have the familiarity and similarity amongst cults. Uh, usually cults are not very racially diverse, although there's exceptions. The Jim Jones cult was very racially diverse. Um, but also accepting help like from your family that's concerned for you. you. I've talked about this in a previous chapter. You may not want to do that because you feel stupid accepting help from them. Uh, now the arousal cost reward model. This is a view that um, you want to help somebody else because seeing them in pain and distress causes pain and distress to you. And so if you feel distressed over their hurt, you are more likely to help them. Okay. And that's most likely to happen when you feel really painful and distressed over the other person's situation. You know, if it's just mild distress, you're less likely to help them. If there's a connection, if there's a sense of we-ness between you and them. Um, and then also if reducing that personal distress has a small cost and a large reward. This will help you to encourage you to help somebody. So let's say you're an activist um, and uh, let's see what kind of, well I talked about Black Lives Matter before. So let's say you're an African American and you want to reduce racism. You could consider this model and how can we get white people to be uh, more pro-social towards black people. So one thing you need to do is you need to create a strong arousal. You need to make them feel personally distressed by the situation. Um, so, uh, and, and that's one of the, the issues that you can see. Now I'm white, so I can, my source is I am white, um, mostly, partially Native American, but uh, anyhow. A lot of white people don't feel distressed over the situation. Like when black people say, oh, I, I was discriminated against. Like I had a friend who she went to the hospital and the doctor treated her terribly. And she's like, it's because I'm black and it's the doctors are so racist. And I'm thinking every time I interact with a doctor, I feel like I'm treated terribly. Like I don't have any personal distress over your situation because I feel like I am treated the same exact way. Um, so if she wants me to feel 
sympathy for her and and help in some way, then she has to make me feel distressed over her situation. And in that situation, I certainly did not feel any distress because I hate doctors and I feel like doctors are trained. Like you can't have a medical degree until you are enough of a jerk to earn it. That's my personal view on doctors. So, um, so how do you make white people feel distressed over the treatment of black people? That's something you'd have to consider. How do you cause that physiological and emotional arousal to occur? What could you do in order to create that? Then there has to be a we connection. How do you make white people feel connected to black people? Because and, and I feel like the Black Lives Matter movement, and not just that, but a lot of um, anti-racism movements, um, Black Panther, I don't know the names of other, but you know, the civil rights sort of things in general, often causes a disconnect between the races rather than a connection that is required. And the more disconnected white Americans feel to black Americans, the less likely they are to be motivated to do anything about racism. So you actually need to build a connection rather than antipathy between the races in order to stop racism. Then you need to create a situation where reducing arousal, reducing personal distress, reducing in this situ in this example racism through helping through through doing something about the racism involves small costs and in this case it's a small cost to the white per white people and a large reward to the white people so there's the, it doesn't cost them as much and it they get something out of it so um, you know, in, in today's situation, what do white people have to pay to reduce racism and what do they get out of it? And of course that sounds selfish, but that's just psychology, okay? <laughs> and maybe you don't like the psychology, you don't, you'd like people to just be purely altruistic, but the truth is that that's not what usually happens. And the arousal cost reward model is something you could use if you were an activist trying to change people's behaviors. So, um, most white Americans, at least ones that I have ever talked to or heard say things, um, believe that there's a huge cost to reducing the current... First of all, they don't feel that distressed because they don't think that racism is... is not. And this is not everybody, of course, but a lot don't feel like it's that big of a problem, not like it used to be. They don't feel a connection. As a matter of fact, they feel very disconnected. Um, they feel like African Americans hate them. And, well, I won't go more into that. And then they also feel like there's a huge cost, that it's basically society is falling apart because of this anti-racism movement. That, um, you know, like when there was, um, what was it called? When black people got job preference over white uh, Affirmative action. So now they lose their jobs. Like, for instance, my mom tried to go to medical school, and she her place was given to a black student, um, even though the, that student had a worse GPA. Her place in medical school was given to a black student because of affirmative action. So that was a huge cost to her. She wasn't able to become a medical doctor because of the, the uh, concept of reducing racism. Okay? So it wasn't a small cost, and certainly there was no reward to it, so did that help? Um, and what reward is there today if white people do reduce racism? Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of people, a lot of white people try to do something that reduces racism, and they're told they're racist for that behavior, so it's like there's huge costs and there's small rewards. So everything in the current anti-racism movement is not causing white Americans to want to reduce racism. So this is why we study psychology, because if black uh, anti-racism activists studied the arousal cost reward model, then they could create a movement that's actually effective and that can help to reduce racism. All right, anyhow, I've stayed on that way too long. Just this is, this is why we're psychologists, or why everybody should be a psychologist. Okay, um, the negative state relief model. So the negative state relief model of helping says that people use helping to manage a particular mood. 
in, in particular, temporary sadness. So we want to help other people because it makes us feel better. It makes us, it manages our mood. Um, we, we know that when you help, it releases all sorts of endorphins and chemicals and things that make you feel good. And so people who are depressed, even mildly depressed, helping somebody else boosts your mood. It can, it's actually something that's used in therapy with people who are depressed. If you're depressed, go help somebody. Because it really does, I mean, research shows it, it relieves depression. Now, maybe not completely, but certainly it gives you a temporary boost. And over time, if you consistently are helpful to others, it can completely alleviate depression depending on what's causing it. Um, hmm. People who are sad or depressed are particularly choosy about the acti pro-social activities they select. So it tends to be volunteering for others. And then avoiding people, maybe this isn't a pro-social behavior, but <laughs> it is a behavior they use. You avoid those who deepen their sadness, okay? So it seems like the most effective way to alleviate depression is volunteering um, for those who are likely to, to dispel their negative mood. So you don't want to go help people who are going to deepen your sadness. You, you pick certain people certain situations that will dispel their negative mood. So you do have to be careful about that. All right. Um, and I'll just... Yeah, I'll skip that. You can just read that yourself. Okay, perspective taking. The process of mentally putting yourself in another's position. Um, if you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes, if you can have empathy versus sympathy is where you just feel sorry for somebody, but empathy is you can, you can understand what they're going through. You can put yourself in their perspective. People who are more empathic are more likely to help other people. Um, and there, you can teach empathy. As a matter of fact, Denmark has a really cool program. Is it Denmark? No, it's probably more than Denmark by now. I'll see if I can find a video for this, but where they teach empathy to children using babies. And um, they try to help them to understand the perspective. And, you know, th this happens all the time in parenting, and you don't realize maybe that you're doing it. But, you know, like when kids come out to the ranch, and I show them a baby chick. Some kids, they get scared, and maybe they drop the chick or something like that. I always try to prevent it from happening, but sometimes it does. It doesn't hurt them, but... Then I'll say to them, I'm like, oh, what, how, how do you think that chick feels when you... When you get scared and you don't hold it and then it falls to the ground you know you have to really care for these these animals and um, and so you teach them to think from the little birds perspective that that's not nice for them that would be a bad experience to have and so then they're braver they take more care of the animal they have you just decrease their empathy and the more empathy somebody has the the more helpful they are the more altruistic they are you know if um, Kids do this all the time where they say something stupid to somebody else, like, um, like, oh, you've got pimples all over your face. Like, oh, thank you, as if I didn't know that. And so you say to them, you know, how do you think that person felt when you said that to them? You know, do you, would you feel good if, you, if somebody said that to you? Well, no, I guess I wouldn't. Well, then do you think they feel good when you say that to them? No. Well, then should you be saying stuff like that? Well, no, I guess not. So you just increase their empathy. You, they're their their desire to be altruistic, to have pro-social behavior, their understanding for other people. All right, that's just talking about all the stuff I've talked about before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So pro-social behavior, something that you can teach children, something that um, you have to teach children if you don't want to have an antisocial psychopath as a child. Um, it's something that's certainly situationally affected but it is a combination of genetic and environmental situations. So you may have a child who is naturally antisocial and you have to work extra hard. If you're lucky, you have a child that's born super pro-social and you don't have to work as hard because they're just more naturally likely to help others. Um, and then also, I like to emphasize that we should value the differences in gender and how they 
do things differently, but it's still both of them are very good. So men are more likely to be heroic, to risk their lives, and women are more likely to be nurturing. Um, but those are both wonderful things that we need in life. All right, so anyhow, I hope you learned a lot, and I'll see you in the next chapter.